Sounds good. Hello, everybody. Welcome to the uh, Jurabinsky Hospital and Cancer Center and uh, Hamilton Health Sciences. Uh, my name is Barry Lum. I'm a gastroenterologist here in uh, Hamilton. And we're here today to do a live uh, colonoscopy on our patient, Dan. Uh, this month is Colon Cancer Awareness Month in Ontario and indeed uh, across Canada and in uh, North America. And that's because colon cancer is common and there's a great opportunity for screening for patients uh, to avoid uh, the long-term complications of a colon cancer. So there are two kinds of screening for colon cancer. One is the poop test, which I'll tell you a little bit more about, and it's what we use for individuals with an average risk of colon cancer. And then there are individuals who have a, high risk of, a higher risk of colon cancer by virtue of their family history. So our patient Dan today uh, is here for a follow-up screening colonoscopy uh, because his mother died of colon cancer uh, at only age 59. And we know that that uh, vastly increases uh, these individuals' risk of getting colon cancer sometime in their life. So Dan has been kind enough to volunteer to do this. Uh, we're going to give him uh, some sedation and then I'll show you how this uh, goes about uh, being done. The key here is for us to try to reassure you that colon cancer screening is important and if at some point you need a colonoscopy, uh, that it's a very reasonable procedure, uh, very easy to get through and uh, hopefully I'll be able to dispel some myths about that for you. So we're going to get going. Dan's going to get some mild sedation to help him relax, a uh, combination of a sedative and a little bit of pain medication. Uh, he yesterday and again this morning completed a very aggressive washout of his colon so that we get the very best look. Sandy's going to be monitoring his oxygen saturation and his heart rate and, he, and so on as we go along. And she's also here to help me if uh, we have to do any uh, interventions during the procedure. So I'm going to show you the scope while he gets his sedation, and then we'll get going. Okay. So this is a colonoscope. You can see that uh, uh, the business end of the scope is, is uh, just a tube with a light on it. And that light is, has with it a very high def camera, just like you get for your television uh, screen. Uh, and on this end, you'll see that I have the controls here that allow me uh, to adjust the scope, go around corners, uh, and uh, get the very best possible images. And then down here, you'll see a little opening that would allow me, if I need to, to put instruments down the scope uh, and to be able to uh, do interventions like remove a polyp uh, or something like that. So I'm going to get ready here and we'll get going. Yes, please. I'm going to turn down the lights a little bit. So, Dr. Lam, we've already got a question from one of our viewers who's interested to know if um, someone with Crohn's disease is at increased risk of colon cancer. So, the, the answer to that is actually a little bit complicated. If they have Crohn's disease that only involves their small intestine, they're not. But if they have extensive inflammation of their colon due to their Crohn's disease, uh, they would be at a higher risk and they would be under a different kind of screening uh, or surveillance program. There are patients who have something called ulcerative colitis, which is a different kind of inflammatory bowel disease. And depending on how long they've had colon, uh, colitis and how extensive it is, they are also at increased risk. But that's a different kettle of fish than what we're doing here. So here we are, we just started the exam, we're uh, in advanced corner, you can see it's beautifully clean, uh, it's nice pink uh, tissue, uh, you can see the little blood vessels underneath it all, and you can see that the, the quality of the image is uh, really quite striking. So I'm going to just talk as I go along here, but one thing that's important to know is there are no pain fibers on the inside of the colon. So even though uh, we're going to be going up and down here, if we have to do anything on the inside of the colon, Dan's not going to feel that. The outside surface of the colon has what we call stretch fibers on it. And so sometimes patients get a little bit of cramping as we go around the corner. 
Uh, and that's because we're stretching the ball, not because we're hurting uh, or causing any damage on the inside of the, the lining. And what we're doing here is we're just carefully advancing the scope, having a careful look through at the lining of the ball as we go. And this is all about now advancing along and trying to make sure that we stretch it as little as possible and get the very best look. So just a few words about colon cancer. Many of you will know, but if you don't, colon cancer is the second most common cause of dying of cancer in Ontario uh, and in North America and in Europe. And the average person uh, who uh, is age 50 or beyond has a lifetime risk of getting colon cancer that's in the range of one chance in 16. It's really much higher than most people realize. And of the people who get it, over half, or close to half, will die as a result of the disease. But we know that if you find colon cancer early, or if you remove polyps before they have a chance to grow up and cause trouble, you can dramatically change that. So a colon cancer found very early has a 90% survival. Whereas a colon cancer found later is not nearly as good. Mm -hmm. And if you remove a polyp that someday might want to grow up and become a cancer, you prevent it from ever happening. So this is a tremendous opportunity to make a difference uh, in the risk for people. Colon cancer always starts as a polyp, which is a little growth on the inside of the bowel that uh, really looks just like a pencil eraser. And I'm going to show you now just a model uh, of, uh, and you'll see on that these two little, two or three little growths. One looks not much like a pencil eraser, uh, sort of stuck on the inside of the bowel, and the other one uh, is a little bigger. Those are meant to de describe what a polyp, or show what a polyp looks like. And, uh, we are looking for those, and if we find any today, uh, we'll plan to remove them. Well, I'm poking along here and uh, trying to get uh, the best look we can. Uh, we're about a halfway around. A little bit of fluid here, which is quite normal. Even though uh, there's no stool left inside the bowel, uh, there's obviously a little bit of fluid here. We have suction as part of our instrument that allows me to, to remove that if I need to. So I started to tell you about colon cancer screening, and there are really two groups of people that the colon cancer check program are trying to identify in Ontario. And one are what we call average risk patients, and those people don't necessarily need a colonoscopy. What they need to do is the poop test, which is kind of the yucky test that involves uh, doing a small smear of, of uh, their stool on a card. And Dan, or Owen's going to show you that now. These are the cards. Get this through your family doctor, and that, after you complete the, uh, the, the test, the people have called blood test, that gets sent away to be analyzed. Once it's analyzed, uh, if it's positive, your family doctor will be notified, and then you'll be notified. And the important point then is that now you do, if you have a positive test, you do need a colonoscopy. It doesn't mean that you have colon cancer. What it means is that uh, uh, there was a little bit of blood uh, in the stool, and that could be as simple as a hemorrhoid or any other number of causes. The important point, though, is if you have a positive test, you should come and have a colonoscopy done uh, because uh, you might be one of the people who has a polyp or who has an early colon cancer, and this is our tremendous opportunity to improve uh, your outcome. What's Dr. important? Well, we've got another question coming on Facebook. Someone is wondering if they have no history in their family of colon cancer, should they still get a colonoscopy? So the, the current recommendations of uh, Cancer Care Ontario and uh, most of the other uh, recommendations is that colonoscopy is not necessary for the average risk person. Colonoscopy should be reserved for people who have a positive occult blood test uh, or who um, 
have other symptoms. So there is no root need for routine colonoscopy in an average risk person. But if you get that positive test, it is absolutely very important that you follow up with your family doctor and have that uh, colonoscopy completed. Now I'm going to pause for a second here, and Sandy's going to help me uh, turn Dan on his back, which will help me get just a little bit better look at the very end of the bowel. We're actually all the way around his colon now. Um, this is just going to allow me to get just a little tighter into this corner here. So we've gone around the whole colon. Uh, the colon's about a meter long. Uh, you can see it's uh, not straight. All these nice uh, folds here that we're going to spend some time looking at. Uh, and we're now over by where his appendix would be. And at the junction of the small and the large bowel. Uh, and we're just going to try and tuck underneath there a second here and get a better look. This is where we are now. And a little bit of fluid here. And we're going to pull that away. We're right in what's called the cecum, which is the part of the colon at the very end. And at the tip of the cecum is his appendix. And uh, show you that opening in a second with a little bit of luck. There we go. And that's right in front of us here. So we're now all the way in. I'm going to take a picture, which we routinely do, just so that we uh, know where we've been and uh, for quality purposes. And we're going to start on our way out. Then you want to go on your side again? So the fecal occult blood test is for the average risk person. And for people who have a family history, like Dan, uh, what we call a first degree relative, they need to have screening done by colonoscopy. And that depends on the relative and the age uh, that the relative had colon cancer. So Dan's mom had colon cancer when she's 59. That increases his risk from one chance in 16 of getting colon cancer to something like one in 10. Uh, and obviously that's very significant. And the recommendation then is that uh, he should be having a colonoscopy every five years. And in fact, this is not Dan's first colonoscopy because uh, he's been with us before. Dr. Lowe, we've got another question. Somebody is wondering, they've had a recent colonoscopy and are noticing some inflammation. Is this something they should be worried about? I'm not quite sure what kind of inflammation they mean, but if they're having a little bit of pain in their backside or irritation, then uh, probably would follow up their family doctor and see if they perhaps uh, got a hemorrhoid or something like that uh, during the time of the preparation. Um, certainly worth following up with the family doctor. There, it's very, very unlikely that that represents a complication of the uh, procedure. Somebody's also asking if they can see the cecum. I just was showing them that, okay, but perfect. I will try and go back and show them again. <laughs> Uh, I just left there. It's sometimes a little hard to go back, but uh, we did take a picture of it and I showed them the, the symptom uh, a moment ago. Uh, I had Dan in a different position when they were looking at the symptom. So I'm going to say no because I don't want to cause them to be on That's the okay. So you can see that this colon has all kinds of little folds and bends in it. And our, the trick here for a really high quality exam is one, the best possible preparation, and, and this is an excellent preparation. And the other is peeking behind all the folds and uh, uh, looking as carefully as we can on the way out to see if we can find any uh, small polyps. Uh, so far, we're doing great and not finding anything, but I just need to take a little time and look carefully here. Talk louder. Talk louder. <laughs> Sorry, apparently I'm not talking <laughs> loud enough. <laughs> we have another question, Dr. Lauder, if you, um, I know you're looking carefully, but if you have, if you're able to answer, someone's wondering if they keep taking the FOBT test and it's normal, do they ever have to go get a colonoscopy or do they keep going with the FOBT? Thank you. So that's a very good point, and the FOBT should be done every two years, and as long as it stays negative, and they don't have any new symptoms that are worrisome, they do not need a colonoscopy. The 
you'll see every once in a while the image kind of gets a little blurry. That's because I have a button here that allows me to wash my lens so I get the very best look. Uh, and so every once in a while you'll see that happen. So the key here, and what we're really trying to get across to everybody, is that colon cancer is a big deal in Ontario and around the world. And there's a tremendous opportunity to improve the outcome of people uh, with colon cancer by discovering it early, and, even, and a great opportunity to prevent cancer by finding polyps and removing them uh, before they have a chance to grow up and cause trouble. Not every polyp will necessarily grow, but there's no way to tell by looking at them uh, which ones have uh, uh, the potential to grow up and cause trouble, and so we our approach here is if we find any polyps, uh, we will rem we remove them all. So we're at Dan's, uh, what we call transverse cone. We're about halfway out. I'll just go back for just a second here. And uh, with an eye of faith, you might even be able to see a little bit of a purple hue up in the top part of the screen there. And that's what we call the hepatic flexure. Uh, that's where the colon is laying against Dan's liver. And we're actually seeing the the color uh, transmitted through the bowel wall. Coming back now through the transverse colon, you see it has a kind of a nice triangular appearance. Uh, and that's uh, a clue for us that we're, where we're heading and what we're looking at. Just going to get a little bit of a change of position here. I'm just suction up a little bit of extra fluid now. Dan had a mild sedative today, uh, as I mentioned, a combination of two different drugs. Uh, he should be ready to head home in about 15 minutes after the procedure is done, 15 to 30 minutes. And uh, he'll be able to get back to his normal activities. Lots of patients stop for food on the way home because he hasn't had any solid food for uh, almost a day now, and uh, they're all hungry. Yes, yeah, thinking maybe a burger. Yeah, a lot of people talk about burgers and steaks uh, mm -hmm. uh, as their goal on the way home. So, Owen, we're asking um, for some interest on the procedure screen. People want to look at what's inside. We have another question, Dr. Lam. Sure. Um, someone's wondering, they don't have a family history of colon cancer, but uh, one of the children has frequent bowel movements, um, and it's the, the parent is a little bit worried about it. Is that something to do with the colon? Should there be concern? Should they talk to a doctor? So this is kind of a separate question, but I'm happy to answer it. Uh, there's a lot of confusion out there about what's normal bowel habit. And everybody uh, somehow along the way got the impression that one bowel movement a day uh, that is supposed to be well-timed and well-organized and so on uh, is normal, and that's not the case. Normal, there is a little pulse right there. So Dan has a little polyp right here. Can you get a picture of it? And uh, we're going to go about removing that in a second. Can you explain what that is? Yeah, so you, I don't know if you can appreciate, but right in the middle of the uh, screen here, you'll see it a little better when I surround it. It's a little protrusion. And that's uh, a tiny little polyp. It looks big on the screen. That's probably no more than about three millimeters, four maybe, in diameter. Completely benign, but it's exactly why we're here today. Uh, we're hoping to find these little guys and remove them before they ever have a chance to cause trouble. Can you explain how a polyp might evolve into colon cancer? Yeah, so polyps start little, and some, as I was trying to mention earlier, have the potential to grow. We don't know why one decides to grow and the other doesn't. Can send it you can see I'm just going to put a little instrument now. This is called a snare. And Sandy's going to close it, and she's going to cut, and that's the end of that polyp. This one's gone ahead. 
I'm going to so I have a little trap here, and I'm going to grab that little guy here, and suck it up into our, into our scope, and there we go, not cut that I guess. Being a little stubborn here, I was taking them to get this. Mm -hmm. That polyp is gone now, and, and uh, the rest of that area is coming out. So I'll just give this a little wash so you can see. Uh, we're all cleaned up, and just a little tiny, it looks like a little pinprick on the side of this pulling. And that bleeding will stop in a second or so, but just keep an eye on it, but it's uh, fine. So that's a very straightforward small polyp, and that's exactly why we're here to try and find these things on it. Sorry, I was finishing this story about the bowel habit. So normal bowel habit is somewhere between three times and four times a day and two or three times a week. So if somebody's got no other symptoms and they just have a different bowel habit than somebody else, it really doesn't mean much of anything. Uh, we would really only look into it if it was a change from their previous uh, or associated with some other symptoms. Uh, if that answers the question. You can see that the, that little tiny bit of bleeding has already stopped. And we're just coming down in the lower part of the corner now. Okay. And we're just coming down to the end. We have another interesting question. Someone's wondering, shouldn't everyone over 50 have a baseline colonoscopy done? What if you have polyps and don't know until it's too late? So the answer is uh, that would be nice, I suppose, but the truth is it's an invasive procedure, uh, even though, as you can see, it's very simple, and uh, unnecessary invasive procedures just aren't something that, uh, that we should be uh, entertaining. And most of the evidence suggests that the fecal occult blood test uh, is uh, a very effective way of screening. So. Uh, the resources aren't there, uh, unnecessary invasive tests should be avoided, and um, the key here is to have a conversation with your family doctor about doing uh, the fecal occult blood test, or uh, if you happen to have a family history, then a conversation about whether you want to have a colonoscopy. One more question. Somebody's wondering, and you may have already mentioned this, how long does the colonoscopy typically take? So I. We've been at this about 20 minutes now. I've been taking a little longer than normal. It usually takes in the range of 15 to 20 minutes, uh, depending on if the colon is twisty, uh, how many polyps we find, or any other uh, interventions that we need to do. Um, this is a little longer than average, but this is pretty typical. And uh, we're now actually about a minute from or less from being finished. We've also had some interest uh, wondering about the prep for the colonoscopy. What is it like? That seems to be a part people have nerves about, and uh, the sedation process as well. So the prep for colonoscopy is one of a variety of options on the market. Uh, there's uh, some of them are small volumes of, of uh, prep, and others are large. But the key is most of them now, all of them now, are very pal much more palatable, and uh, unfortunately. If you're going to get a high quality colonoscopy, you've got to get the clean out, which means you've got to comply with, uh, with all the detailed instructions that the uh, doctor's office will give you. Most people will tell you that, it, that they were worried about it, but that it uh, was not a big deal at the end of the day. And I'm sorry, the second question was sedation. So uh, we use a combination of sedation here. Uh, which is a drug called midazolam, uh, kind of like a similar drug to, to uh, Valium, uh, and another medication, a, a very short-acting narcotic. Uh, that is more than adequate for the vast majority of patients. We're at the end here now, and I'm just going to flip my scope around and have one more look at the very lowest part of the bowel here. Uh, right there, you can see the scope, actually. Let me take a picture of that. 
I'll put my scope back around uh, and uh, take out a little bit of the air. And we're done. So uh, the sedation uh, in some places is a little bit more aggressive. It kind of depends on the the uh, physician and the, and the practice that they use. Some people use uh, a drug called propofol, which is the uh, a white drug that everybody knows is the um, the aggressive sedative, and it can be used for for routine colonoscopy, but for the majority of cases, it's not necessary. If somebody has a particularly challenging colon or a difficult procedure in the past, then we'll uh, schedule them on a separate list uh, with the help of an anesthetist to, to be able to get a, a full exam and have them stay comfortable. So thank you everybody for uh, watching us. Uh, I hope that we'll convince you that colonoscopy is uh, a pretty straightforward business. It allows us to remove polyps the way we uh, just did for Dan. Uh, and I encourage you to Talk to your family doctor about colon cancer screening, and if you're over 50, get the poop test done and, and uh, do the right thing. Thanks.